cooking, we're cooking. Um, okay, so I take it everybody did the whole Slack thing? Yeah, that's That all worked? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I think I responded to a couple of them. So uh, that's how we will communicate if uh, I have any class announcements or anything like that. You can also use that for sending uh, private messages. We use that in all of our courses here. So it's a good way for you to communicate with other students as well. Um, so you'll be using that during your entire time here. Uh, okay, so we talked, uh, uh, we were starting to introduce programming last class. We talked uh, about how com computer programming is kind of a, how a human tells a computer what to do, right? That's our goal with this guy. And the tool we use to do that is something called a programming language. All right, we uh, probably used the example, I think, of what, walking last time? How oh, that's like a really intricate thing, really difficult for us to do. We all are pretty good at it, but we can't really explain how we do it. And too this it, very yeah, too many, too many things going on. And that's the problem. Okay, so, you know, I always come back to this idea that human beings are so good at solving problems that we have forgotten how to articulate how to solve complex problems. We've actually forgotten how to articulate how to solve even simple problems. How many of you are cooks in here? Or, you, you, I know how to not make things catch fire in the microwave, right? My wife can't say that. She literally burns water. So I'm, I'm the cook in the, uh, the, the family. It's tough, but she, my wife one time ignited a hot pocket. You know those hot pockets that go inside the little sleeve with the, 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 the to make them crispy? Oh, she made it crispy. Yeah, I think at around eight minutes those things light up. Yeah, because I think you're supposed to cook them for like, what, like a minute 15 or something like that? Something like that, but she put an extra one. So it was like 11 minutes and then forgot about it. I was just talking to me about it, something and then all of a sudden you heard there was flames billowing out of the microwave. So what does she do? She shoves me into the kitchen. That's love, right? You sacrifice me. Like, Go take care. I, I had to grab this flaming hot pocket. You don't have a fire extinguisher? Well, we do, but uh, you don't think about that when you have a hot pocket on fire. You think about preserving the possible food. <laughs> that might be part of that that's still edible. So, All right, so issue is, so the reason I asked whether how many of you are cooks is even if we take a relatively simple thing. So walking, we used an extreme example last time, right? Obviously, lots and lots and lots of variables going on there. But let's say you're explaining to somebody how to make a peanut butter and jelly. Something like that, okay? As human beings, if you were talking to another human being, you would say, oh, you grab a couple of slices of bread, you get the peanut butter, you get the jelly, slap it on each side, put them together. Yeah, but one more That's probably enough for a person, right? A person, okay, we know what bread is. We probably know where the where the bread is, or at least we're you know we can go on a hunt. Okay, we can hunt around the kitchen until we find something that's bread-like. Okay, <laughs> and uh, you know we can fill in a lot of those blanks. But if you're having to try to tell a computer, articulate to a computer, every single little step of what it takes to make a peanut butter and jelly. Even if we assume that the bread is provided, now you have to say, you can't just say, spread the peanut butter on the bread. You have to provide the tool for it. You have to provide how to use that tool. Is there a specific technique? How much pressure to apply? Yeah, I mean, all sorts of stuff like that. I mean, you, I mean, especially, like, how, how many of you refrigerate peanut butter? I uh, don't know. Oh, you can't spread refrigerated peanut butter. It doesn't work. Okay? I mean, yeah, it doesn't work. You got to, it, it, it doesn't work. Trust, trust. I used to refrigerate peanut butter. My mom taught me wrong. That's what happened. Um, so my wife corrected that. Um, but in any case, you know, the idea is there's there's techniques to it, and everybody has different techniques. There, you know, there's probably five or six different, you know, variations of making a peanut butter and jelly and that kind of stuff. So kind of the point here is that human beings were so used to dealing with other people. That talking to computers are dif is difficult for us, all right? Forget about the language. Who cares if we're using Python or Java or C++ or any of these other languages? And we'll kind of talk about some comparisons of languages here uh, probably today. Um, but the language doesn't matter. We're still talking to people, all right? Uh, if you speak another language, um, you know, uh, so I only speak English and I speak enough Spanish like order at Taco Bell, I guess. 
Um, but, you know, if, if you do speak another language, you're fluent in another language, something that's a truth is when you're talking to your friends in that language, you're using the same problem solving as you would do if you're talking to your friends in English or French or Spanish because they're people. Find the words that are coming out of your mouth sound different because you're using a different language, but it's the same stuff. You're saying the same stuff because you're dealing with people. So we're all experts at dealing with people, but as computer scientists, we need to become experts at also dealing with computers. And that means that we need to have a shift in our mindset. And that's why computer programming is going to be difficult for a lot of you. There's, there's a transition period where you have to get used to breaking problems down into tiny, tiny, tiny little parts. Okay, and we're not going to be very good at it at first because it's not natural for us. Make sense? All right, so when you suck at programming at the beginning, it's not because you're stupid. Okay, it's because you're a person okay? and you are used to dealing with people. All right, so programming languages, these are tools specifically designed to allow a human to tell a computer what to do without the human being changing the way they already solve problems. All right, so the idea here is that we're already kind of set in our ways, all right? Even though we're all in here willing to change a little bit to be able to talk to this dumb computer in front of us, we're not all that interested in programming in zeros and ones, right? You know, we, we, we start off and say that a computer understands, you know, we have, we have different types of languages. So let's, let's uh, do this guy. So three types of programming languages. Okay, and like I said, I do have the slides up on uh, Blackboard. I think I put the link up there, pretty sure. So three types of programming languages. We have machine language. So that's zeros and ones. All right, so um, we have the little two-button keyboard sitting here. So you're a professional programmer. You're just sitting there just tapping out ones and zeros all day long. How long until you go insane? Well, it depends on how much stuff. All right. Best case, you last two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Best case, you last two minutes. Now, how long until you make your first mistake? Oh, first second. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're not going to go that many ones and zeros in a row until you flip flop a zero and a one. Okay, that's not for people. Okay, but now computers like zeros and ones. That's digital logic. It's on or off. Do I do this or do I do this? So we're on different ends of the spectrum. Okay. Human beings live in the ish world, right? Okay, everything, we, we just kind of, we give an idea of what we want and we rely on other people to kind of fill in the blanks. Computers are completely on the other end of the spectrum, extremely precise. If a zero or a one is out of place, it means something completely different. If you've ever seen the show Futurama and uh, Bender does his, uh, what he does plays with zeros and ones, have you seen that? Bender gets up there and just zero, zero, one, 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 zero, 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 and he's supposed to be like a robot acting in a play. And you're supposed to understand what he's saying. Future, is that still on? No, they steer it. But that's not that old. Like, I'm not dating myself that no. much, right? That's like, you know who, you know about Futurama. It's like a thing. Yeah, I mean, I, this, I didn't like reference Lassie or something. Right? Do you know what Lassie is? <laughs> okay, it's probably like was a reference in some Saturday Night Live skit or something. All right, so we have machine language zeros and ones. At the end of the day, no matter what we do, we ultimately need to speak zeros and ones to the computer, all right? That has to happen. Now, we've all decided that that's not for us. So we're not going to talk to this dude directly at the computer's level, all right? Well, now we have low-level languages, okay? So this guy has a one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU. All right, well, what does that mean? Let's start another slide here. What's the CPU? What is that guy? Microprocessor. All right, that's what it stands for. That's how we always start, right? Whenever we have an acronym, we all let's fill in the blanks. So, so it stands for Central Processing Unit. What does it do? It doesn't it regulate everything. Okay, well, what does that mean? Okay. Now, here's the punchline. So I'm setting you up for this, right? One of you might get this right, but for the most part, the CPU is kind of a mystery, right? It definitely costs some money. And when you order a computer, you kind of want to get the best CPU you can afford. You don't know why. Just faster is better. 
bigger number is better. Core i7 must be better than core i5. No, it might not be. Who knows? Depends what you're doing. Okay. So what does a processor actually do? So we want to we want to kind of demystify what this what this thing is. All of our computers have it, right? All of our computers have a processor. Is that just because they wanted to tack a couple extra hundred dollars onto the machine? Or is it kind of a necessary piece? All right, what do they do? Oh, every, oh, that's well, so descriptive. <laughs> See, he's talking to a person, that's the problem. He's like, I do everything. That's, figures, he like, covers his bases. You do that on tests, right? You know, when you're not quite sure what the answer the teacher's looking for, you just talk all around it, hoping you say something that the teacher thinks you know what you're talking about. Yeah, everything probably isn't going to cut it for that. You know, you got to be more precise than that. What does it, what does it do? Go ahead. Huh? Flip switches? Okay, that's not necessarily, I mean, that's way, a way better answer than everything. A way better answer than, I mean, everything's really kind of a crap answer. That's really what I'm saying. Do the magic trick. Ah! Oh, see, he's had my classes before. I had my classes before. So... At the end of the day, our computers know how to do a bunch of things, okay? Now, when we get down to the, at the, the bare bones of this here, I, actually, let me go this route. I'm going to show you, we're going to be looking at a Hello World program pretty soon here. Uh, let's do Hello World Assembly. Is this a good one? Ah, that's good enough. This is the low-level language that we're looking at here. Okay. Now, definitely better than a wall of zeros and ones. We all can agree with that. Still looks a little cryptic-y, but better than a wall of zeros and ones. Now, I mentioned a, a minute ago that our low-level languages have a one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU. So what I want you to do is I want you to think of your CPU like a magician. It knows how to do all these magic tricks, okay? This giant list of things it knows how to do. And we're not necessarily sure the nature of those things right now, but for right now, they're things, okay? And older processors knew how to do less things. Newer processors knew how to do, know how to do more things. And sometimes when a new processor comes out uh, and it says it can do certain tasks five times faster than last year's model, what it's done is it said, okay, well, it's, seems to be pretty common that these three tricks all happen in a certain order pretty often. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a bigger magic trick that's a combination of those three, and it'll happen faster as one move instead of three moves. Stuff like that, all right? So our CPUs perform a whole bunch of magic tricks. And we tell our CPU, do this, then this, then this, then this, then this. And each of those, and, then, and after you, you put a whole bunch of these magic tricks together, something real happens, all right? Now, the funny thing is, this is in Harry Potter, where, you know, you, you do your magic tricks and something that maybe makes sense to people happens. You know, we're talking about moving this piece of information from this memory location to this memory location, then move this from this memory location and for, some, for some odd reason. So if we walk through our typical Hello World program, and uh, this is for, I think, Linux, right? All right, so, you know, we have, we have different operating systems, right? So uh, we have, uh, you know, your, con your big ones are what, Linux, U uh, Linux, Windows, Mac OS is your desktop guys. You got Unix in there as well. Then on the mobile side, we have iOS, that's an operating system. You have Android, which is a Linux-based operating system. Um, you have you know, Windows Mobile, stuff like that. These are all operating systems. So now when I say that we have uh, that this particular assembly language, this is Intel-based assembly language for talking to a Linux operating system. So every operating system knows how to do kind of the same crap, okay? It knows how to put stuff on the screen. It knows how to write stuff to a hard drive. It knows how to read stuff from a, a CD or a DVD, that kind of stuff. So every operating system has a collection of stuff that makes it an operating system, right? Whether you're a Mac user or a PC or a PC user, you kind of expect pretty similar stuff from your operating system. They might look a little bit different, but you don't say, well, I'm not gonna use the, the Windows machine because it doesn't know how to write to a hard drive. There's kind of a commonality amongst all operating systems so they all know how to do the same stuff, right? Okay, but now each operating system has its own way of doing that. 
and its own like naming convention for how, how do you say you want to write something to the screen? What, what's required to write something to a screen in Linux versus Mac OS versus Windows? If they're going to be similar, but slightly different. Okay, these guys are called system calls. I'm not going to get too much into those in here. That's something from a, a different course, a later course you'll take. But just know for us that different operating systems have different collections of system calls that together ultimately provide the same services or similar services. All right. So we actually have to have a separate assembly language for each operating system because when we do stuff and we're, when we're directing our CPU to perform certain magic tricks, we're doing that in, in many cases in terms of the extra things that our operating system provides for us, the tools that our operating system provides for us. So if I kind of walk through this, each line here is one instruction to the CPU. That's what I mean by that one-to-one -one relationship. So when I'm writing a piece of software in a low-level language like this, every line of code has a one-to-one -one relationship with a magic trick on the CPU. Okay, so you're telling the CPU to do something very tiny, and by the end, something happens. Now, what I'm telling you is that all of this crap here ultimately just makes the word hello, or the phrase hello world show up on the screen in text. That's a lot of stuff to do something that seems pretty simple. Most software programs that we're used to do a little bit more than just make hello world show up on the screen. Okay, I think he was telling us last time that he wants to be a game programmer, right? So hello, that was you, right? You're the game guy? But, but yeah, you don't know anymore. Yeah, you're the everything guy. You know, anything goes, right? Okay, so <laughs> this is a surfer too. It's it's all this all goes. Um, all right, so what's what's that? <laughs> I guess that's a, a true statement. Um, all right, so you know the the idea here is is that that's something very simple. So if we think about our big video games, Battlefield or whatever, pick your favorite complex game, uh, uh, Call of Duty, whatever. Um, a little bit more advanced than Hello World on the screen, okay? And last time we said that things like Battlefield or Call of Duty are trivial compared to a human being just walking. Okay, so we're dealing with something completely simplistic. And we're all looking at this and saying, okay, that's mostly gibberish, okay? Not as bad as the wall of zeros and ones, but mostly gibberish, okay? So every line of code we write here translates to one magic trick on the CPU. So let's walk through this. So what are we doing? Well, I'm gonna go a little bit out of order here. So down here, we have a section called data. So this is where we're remembering things. We're creating a couple of variables. So we're creating a variable called message and we're putting in there the message, hello world. Okay. We're creating another variable called length, well, L-E-N, which is equal to the length of message. This is how you get the length of message. Just don't worry about that, but that's what it is. All right, so this is kind of our given information. This is the message we want to display. This is how long it is. All right, that's what we ultimately want this program to do. And this guy up here is going to operate on that stuff. So now, this is where we start. Okay, it says start. So we're going to walk through this line by line. So notice that we have four move instructions. So one of the magic tricks our CPU knows how to do is it knows how to move stuff from one place to another place in memory. Okay, and their memory comes in some different flavors, but don't worry about too much about that right now. Okay, but I'm effectively telling the CPU to do the same magic trick four times in a row with slightly different inputs. So the first time I'm saying, go ahead and move the length of my message into this storage location, this lo location called EDX. Okay, those are called hardware registers or pieces of memory built out of hardware that sits on the CPU. Okay, so the CPU has all these little buckets to store stuff. Doesn't matter. Point is, I'm moving the length of my message to this random place, EDX, at least seemingly random place. Then I'm moving the message itself into another storage location, ECX. Then I'm moving just haphazardly the number one into this storage location. Then I'm just randomly moving the number four into this storage location. So I have effectively staged 
stage stuff into four different stores locations. Right, I got the. Oh, oh my gosh, it would take forever to use low level languages. We'd rather do this than ones and zeros, but this isn't really our cup of tea either. Okay, we'll talk about why we might do this every now and then in a few minutes. All right, so I'm staging four values in four different places. Now, these first two values, these guys had meaning to us, right? Length is the length of the message. Message is the message itself. Why did we need to know the length and the message itself? Well, uh, in, in at the underlying level, when we have a string of characters, we aren't able to determine how long it is without supplying how long it is. It's kind of a how computers are built thing. Leave it at that for now. You'll learn about that in the computer architecture class. But this one in four seems pretty arbitrary. Now, if you look at the little notes over here to the side, the one corresponds to where we want to write the message. So one happens to correspond to something called a file descriptor. And file descriptors, this is a Linux specific thing. Uh, Linux is known as uh, something called a POSIX operating system. Have you, how many of you have ever seen the, the, the term POSIX written somewhere? Probably didn't know what the heck it meant, but you saw it. So uh, um, I'll just write it so you can see what it looks like. POSIX. Okay, so Linux is a POSIX operating system. Um, some flavors of modern Unix are also POSIX operating systems. Mac OS is a POSIX operating system. Um, anybody know why Mac OS is a POSIX operating system? It's based on Unix. Yeah, I mean, why? People, people say that the Mac OS is, oh, it's pretty stable. Yeah, it should be. They stole it from an operating system from the 1980s. And it's had quite a few years of, uh, it's based on OpenBSD. So they've had quite a few years of uh, people using it, working some of the kinks out. Okay, and then you have those folks that say, well, Macs don't get viruses, right? How many of you heard the, the Mac uh, fanboys say Macs don't get viruses? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you've heard that, right? What do you think? Mac users, do Mac get viruses? Why don't they get viruses? Yeah, it, it, so if you're if you're a virus writer, so you're one of these jerks that wants to like hurt me, you know, hurt people, do you attack the 95% of the people running Windows or do you attack the 5% of the people running the Mac? Yeah, you attack the one. You attack the big group of people. Because you're a jerk. That's what you do. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, I could probably make an argument that maybe the Mac OS is slightly more secure than uh, uh, Windows, but it has nothing to do with Apple. It's anything that most of the insecurities Apple added, right? They put in there. I mean, its security mostly comes from the fact that it's based on Unix. Okay. Windows is a great operating system. Microsoft has great, super smart people working for them. Um, they just happen to be a big old bullseye when it comes to desktop operating systems. Okay, but Linux is known as a POSIX operating system. This is more trivia knowledge, not necessarily that I'll never test you over, over uh, this thing here, but um, a telltale factor of POSIX operating system, a telltale sign rather, is everything is a file. That's what POSIX operating, operating systems say. Whether it's a USB jump drive you connect it in, or it's a hard drive, or it's an actual file, or it's a directory, whatever it is, it, the operating system treats it as if it's a file. Okay? So, when we read over here that this guy says this is a file descriptor, one of our file descriptors in a Linux operating system is something called standard output. Same thing exists in Windows. Okay? Standard output is our standard output on our computer. And for us, standard output on the computer is the monitor, right? What's standard input for a computer? Probably the keyboard. Okay, that's how we input crap into the computer at the standard level, right? We have some other ways we do it. We have mice and things like that, but go back to the beginning. Standard input is the keyboard. Standard output is the monitor. There's also something called standard error, which also goes in the monitor, but it allows you to split error messages and normal output into two separate streams in case you want to store them in different places. Don't worry about that. All right. So what we're putting into this storage location is where do we want to write the message? We want to write it to the monitor. That's what we're doing. Okay. Next thing. Ah, we have a system call. So Linux, the way Linux writes something to the screen 
is it does it through this thing called SysWrite. It's a built-in system call in, uh, uh, in Linux. The Mac version of this might be called something slightly different. It might also not be numbered four. It might be number nine, okay? Windows might be called something slightly different. It also might not be numbered four. It might be number two. So that's why you have to have assembly languages for the different operating systems because they're not compatible with each other, okay? So I'm saying I'm writing a message that's this long. Here's the message. This is where I want to write it. So now that I've staged these three values, now I'm saying go ahead and call the syswrite system call, the program that's written inside of Linux that knows how to write crap to the screen. Okay? So inside of syswrite is going to be a whole bunch more assembly code, but somebody else wrote this for us. So this is actually a power tool. Rather than us having to reinvent the wheel and teach our computer how to put something on the screen, we're going to go ahead and leverage the syswrite system call to do it for us. And the syswrite system call happens to require three inputs from us. It needs to know where do you want me to write it, what do you want me to write, and how long is it. Those are the three pieces of information that system call happens to need. And more specifically, that system call says, I'm going to look for the length in this storage location. <laughs> I'm going to look for the message in that storage location. I'm going to look for where you want me to write it, what file descriptor you want me to write it to in that storage location. All right? That's why we stage those three specific values in those three specific places. Now, at this point, we've issued four magic tricks, but nothing has actually occurred yet. All right? So our CPU has done four things but we haven't pulled the rabbit out of the hat yet. The magician's not done. Okay, so we're waving our hands around. We've put one value over here, another value over here, another value over here, another value over here. And now the magic happens. This very next line, we interrupt our CPU. And we turn things over to the operating system. This is how, this is a memory address. This is where the, uh, the starting point for the Linux operating system lives. It's a proprietary nature of the Linux operating system. The starting point for Windows might be someplace else. A starting point for Mac might be someplace else, but this is the starting point. So essentially what we're doing is I've waved my hands, I've done all the beginning magic trick stuff, and now I'm going to say operating system take over. And what's the operating system going to do? The first thing it's going to do, it's going to look inside of EAX and find out, okay, what is it that you want me to do? Ah, I found a four there. You want me to write something. Great. So when you want me to write something, I need to, I need three pieces of information. Let's hope you put them where I'm looking for them. So I'm going to look in EDX to find out the length. I'm going to look in ECX to find out the message. I'm going to look in EBX to find out where you want me to write it. And then after all that, I'm actually going to write it to the screen. That's when the magic trick actually happens. That's when the rabbit comes out of the hat. All right. So once syswrite, once we've called the kernel, which is uh, the, the name for the actual operating system. So I ask you, uh, you know, we've mentioned three operating systems today, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. Those actually aren't, well, Linux is, but those actually aren't operating systems. Those are what are known as distributions. The actual operating system for Windows is called the NT kernel. The actual operating system for Mac is the OpenBSD kernel. The actual operating system for Linux is the Linux kernel. Okay, those are the actual operating systems. They lie underneath all of our icons and user applications and all that stuff. You'll learn about that in the uh, operating systems class. All right, so tell the operating system, do your magic. I've gone ahead and staged everything you need. So the operating system does that. Then we return back to our magic. The very next thing is notice we've overwritten what we originally put in EAX. We originally put a four there. Now I'm going to overwrite that guy with a one. One must be a different system call. EAX must be where I put my system calls. So right before I tell my operating system to take over, I must need to put something in EAX that kind of directs my operating system what I want it to do. It knows where to look. Okay, we have to know that ahead of time. So we go ahead and put a one in there, and one actually relates to sys exit. All right. Now I'll tell you that the length of our message is still in EDX, 
Our message itself is still an ECX, and uh, the, uh, uh, the standard output file descriptor is still an EBX. Those are still there. We haven't moved them. We haven't overwritten them. We just overwrote EAX. And then we went ahead and interrupted the CPU and called upon the operating system again. The operating system, first thing it does is it goes and looks in EAX and says, what do you want me to do? Ah, there's a one there. One means you want me to make this program exit. Leave the CPU. We're done. Terminate. Whatever. And it just so happens that sysexit doesn't require any additional information. So it's not going to go and look in EDX or ECX or EBX. Those guys are just left over. You know, there's, we just leave them behind. They'll get overwritten by the next program or something like that. All right. So our program finally ends. After all of that, all that happened is hello world showed up on the screen. Is that the kind of programming that we really want to do? Certainly more doable than ones and zeros, right? If we want to do the ones and zeros version of this, each of these guys, each of these instructions actually translate into ones and zeros. So the move command might be command 10111101111. That might be what that command is. Yeah, oh, but I mean, do we, we don't want to memorize all those things, right? So you could have your little cheat sheet, right? Like, okay, I want to do move. Okay, that's uh, one, zero, one, 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 zero. One. We're going to screw up pretty quick, right? Okay, so we're definitely not right in the binary. So this one line here, if you were to translate this into its binary equivalent, you're going to have the binary version of the move command. So what that maps to, then you're going to have the binary version of this storage location, whatever that maps to. So you're going to need your cheat sheet for that, for that com the computer architecture. Then you'll have the binary version of the length. Okay, and the length is, in this case, what is this? Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So it's going to be the binary version of 13. Okay, probably as, uh, since this guy is a... 32-bit register, this will be the 32-bit version of the binary number 13. So you have a whole bunch of zeros followed by a couple of zeros and ones for 13. So this big long line here is going to be, and this, these are mostly 64-bit processors, so this would be 64 zeros and ones to represent this guy, followed by um, 64 zeros and ones to represent that guy, so we're at 128 zeros and ones. Followed by, this guy is a 32-bit uh, register, so this guy is only going to be 32 bits. So followed by 32 bits. So we have, um, what, 128 plus 32 is what, 196? One, no, 170, what, two, one, 128 plus 32, 160. All right, so we have 160. <clears throat> zeros and ones that we need to produce accurately in order to rewrite that line. Uh -uh. We're not doing that. Okay. Okay, I've been uh, programming for a few minutes. I started programming when I was nine. Okay, and I was nine at least two years ago. Um, so that was a while ago. I'm not writing 160 zeros and ones to reproduce this one single line. It's ridiculous, okay? Humans can't do that. We're going to screw up so quickly. I don't know. I don't think so. I start, I mean, now we're starting to go cross over to Android territory. You know, like Data from Star Trek, Next Generation. He may, Maybe him. Maybe Data could do it. You know who Data is, right? You watch Star Trek, Next Generation? Now he's like the reference of jokes, right? I think Data makes appearances in Big Bang Theory. Pretty sure he's been on that show. All right. So... We're not doing the zeros and ones. We've already written that off. Even this guy right here, it seems like it's an awful lot of work and an awful lot of things to remember or at least have to reference on a cheat sheet to pull off something so simple. So if he wants to be a game programmer and I say, okay, well, you're now on the team to write the next uh, uh, Battlefield, you think there's going to be a few more uh, lines of code here in a low-level language than this for uh, Battlefield? It's a who? It's a Pong clone now. Oh, you should see the assembly language for Pong. I, I, I think it's something like uh, 600 and some odd lines for Pong. Something pretty simple. 
Yeah, it's, it's a human being, if push came to shove, could do this. And we do do this. Our software has to start with something. We're going to talk about compilers here in a few minutes. And somebody had to write the compiler, and they had to write it like this. All right? Uh, it is a lot easier than ones and zeros. That's why, I, that's why I broke this down and said, would you rather write this or 160 zeros and ones without error? It's not a hard choice there. Okay? The big issue here with the low-level language is, even though this looks English-like and each one of these lines isn't really overly difficult to write, it does so little that it's like you're building a house with uh, like hand tools. You know, with a normal hammer and nails and, and uh, you know, a hand screwdriver instead of a power drill and you know, the, the power nail gun, those guys. People have done it, right? I mean, you go back in time, people build houses using nothing. Right. Yeah, I mean, hand tools or, or tools they made by hand. You know, they hammer in uh, you know, this spike with this piece of wood that they picked up that was, you know, it's heavy enough to hammer the nail in, but light enough that I can wield it. We can do it, but we don't like doing it, right? You know, anymore, we like using power tools for everything. That's, that's, that's makes a, it makes things easier. Yeah, I mean, I mean, not everybody can be like, I mean, I jog to work every morning. So far, I, did, I, I, didn't get, I didn't get any, like, laughs from that. How far would you live? Like eight miles. Even if I said three blocks, would you? <laughs> I, don't, I don't really uh, represent the jogger body type. More of a SUV, <laughs> SUV body type. It's uh... <laughs> all right. So uh, we like power tools. We like life to be easy for us. And I'm already starting off telling you that computer programming is going to be hard because we need to relearn how to solve problems. We don't need to deal with the zeros and ones or even this to overly complicate things. Life's already going to be hard for us. Okay. We want power tools, and this kind of goes back to what we talked about here when I said the programming language is a tool that's specifically, that's specifically designed to allow a human to tell a computer what to do without the human changing the way they already solve problems too much. All right, We're only going to move a little bit away from us solving problems the way we're already used to solving them with human beings. You know, we're not going to go all the way down to that zero and one level, and we're not going to really like being down to that low level. We really want to deal with a power tool. So when we're down here talking about different types of languages, the language we really want to be working with is a high-level language. This guy has a one-to-many relationship. relationship with a CPU. That means every line of code we write in a high-level language translates into a whole bunch of those little magic tricks. So if we're in Java and we want to write hello world, we say system.out.println hello world. If we're in Python and we want to write hello world, we say print hello world. And under the hood, all that extra crap happened. Make sense? We like that better. It's still going to be foreign to us because we're not used to the language. We're not used to, you know, in Java, we have to put a semicolon at the end of the lines. And Python, indentation is important. Okay, so, you know, this guy would have to be indented underneath the subheading it's in. So we got to pay attention to some structural stuff, some extra things that we're not used to working with. But at least it looks, you know, like it's in, a, it's in the ballpark of something that we can handle as a human being without going nuts. Make sense? All right. So what's the CPU? This guy performs a, well, this is a collection of magic tricks that when called upon in a certain order, Something happens. Okay, that's what the CPU provides us. The CPU provides us a collection of magic tricks that our computer knows how to do. 
So every problem that we solve on a computer, we have to solve in terms of the magic tricks that the CPU provides to us. As well as the power tools that the operating system provides to us. You know, we got off easy over here because we were able to use the SysWrite power tool that the person who wrote the Linux operating system, the group of people who wrote the Linux operating system, already wrote for us. Who knows how many lines of uh, assembly language code that is? Just this guy. Who knows even what that does? We just know that that, we go to Home Depot, we buy the power tool and it's called SysWrite. We know, we don't know what's inside the box, but we just know if I feed this guy three pieces of information, he'll write it to the, the place I tell him to write it to. Who cares about the what's inside the box? We, it's already written. All right. So between the magic tricks the CPU provides us, these guys, and then the, let's call it the, the super magic tricks that the operating system provides us, we're able to make computer programs. Okay. So, and the CPU is an integral part of that because every single problem that we solve, we have to solve in terms of the uh, CPU that we are uh, um, working on and the operating system in which we're working. So this kind of goes back to when you, uh, if you're buying a, you know, looking at a new video game or a new piece of software, you, you know, buy the latest version of Microsoft Word. A lot of times it'll say minimum system requirements on the side, right? You seen those? You seen the minimum system requirements and a lot of times you just ignore them? Like, ah, whatever. They have like a minimum operating system you need to have. Uh, they have a, a minimum processor that you need to have, a, a minimum amount of memory that you need to have. And sometimes you'll try to squeak by and say, well, I don't quite have enough RAM, but let's see what happens, right? And it sort of kind of works. You can get away with that in RAM a little bit because we have this thing in our computer called virtual memory, which is like fake RAM. It uses your hard drive to fake RAM, but uh, your hard drives are a lot slower than normal RAM. So you're going to feel it. If you're, if you're leveraging your hard drive to run a video game, it's not going to be good. Uh, now, with that in mind, um, when you look at the minimum system requirement for a game or for a word processor, let's say, and it says it's, this guy requires a uh, Pentium Core i3 processor running at at least 1.8 gigahertz, let's say something like that. Do you have to pay attention to that? If it says that it requires a Intel Core i3 processor, why might that be? Some of the magic tricks that guy uses might be magic tricks that were first available on that processor. Processors before that aren't going to be aware of those magic tricks. If you go back to the original like 8086 processor from Intel, that guy had far, far, far fewer magic tricks on there than the latest, greatest Core i7, whichever architecture, but what, Skylake is the new one, I think, that they just came out with. Whatever it is, it has a lot more magic tricks. But each one is a superset of the previous one. Okay, so all the stuff that, in, that our Intel Core i7 brand new, latest, greatest processor has is a superset of what the old 8086 has. So if you had a piece of software that would run you know, 20 years ago, it'll still run today. It was a, provided the operating system still is, is still around because you still had those system calls involved, right? But in terms of the magic tricks that this guy knew about, it'll still run. But we have new, better magic tricks. Combo magic tricks. Things that we didn't even know we could do back then in our latest, greatest processors. And part of that's been, hey, we, you know, our processors haven't necessarily substantially changed in size over the years. Um, uh, what have they done? They have... Uh, um, uh, the, the, the processors for a while were kind of like a, almost like a, a rectangular looking thing. And then they moved to more of a square, but the physical size of our processors have not changed in a while yet. Every single year we get better at fitting more magic tricks on them because we get better at putting more transistors onto that processor and putting them closer together without the thing blowing up in fire because it all produces a bunch of heat. So we get better at heat dissipation. We get better at putting them on the same space by building those, let's say, houses closer together without them impacting each other, without there being like crosstalk and things like that. So our manufacturing process gets better and better and better. Make some sense? All right, so for your homework, 
go to our this class. Everybody has the book? So, CSC 200. I want you to go ahead and let's look at Let's look at 1.1 through 1.4 in the first chapter. And you'll probably have a quiz at the beginning of next class. Okay. All right. Um, so we're gonna, you're going to be kind of learning about Python on this side. You're going to be learning at, for my lectures about programming in general. And then we'll finally finish that introduction and we'll come together and start doing stuff. Sound good? All right. I will see everybody on Friday. Thank <laughs> you.